everyone. Welcome to Global Voices. Thanks for coming. Great um, showing today. I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing from Dr. McDermott. I want to introduce him briefly, and then I'll also um, introduce Chrysan Adenoyan. Uh, this is Dr. Gerald McDermott. He's one of our own professors here at Beeson Divinity School. He teaches world religions. He's also a Jonathan Edwards scholar. He's even written a book on famous stutters. You should ask him about that sometime. Uh, he has a heart for the global church, and this past summer he spent some time in Nigeria, and I was, as I was getting the updates, my heart was stirred, and I knew immediately that I wanted him to share at, at this Global Voices. So in just a minute, would you welcome him? But uh, right now, uh, because we do have a professor on this campus uh, who is a, um, a wonderful Christian man who teaches in the School of Social Work, uh, Dr. Chrysan Adenoyan, uh, obviously we want him included on this as well. And so he's going to share for just a couple minutes uh, before Dr. McDermott comes up. Come on up, Chrysan. Uh, well, I want to thank very uh, profoundly Dr. Gerald McDonald for mm. brave enough to go to Nigeria, to go to the mm. epicenter of the jihad war in Nigeria. That's just. And first and foremost, I want to recognize the coolies for their, you know, uh, vanguard and uh, what I'll call their, um, I'm using the light word now. They did the missionary work in the 60s mm. to go to Nigeria. So I just want you guys to give it up to the coolies. They're there. <laughs> I believe very strongly that the work you guys started in the 60s during the Civil War is what has got us to where we are in Nigeria. Mm. And uh, what you guys are going to see today, I really uh, commend and I thank the Lord for the work of Dr. Gerald McDonald. What is happening in Nigeria is very, very, um, it's very surreal. It's very sad. But uh, all hope is not lost. The reason being that in this middle belt area of Nigeria, the, st the state is called Plato State. Just, you know, people call it Jesus' own city. You know, it's a, it's, like, it's a huge epicenter of religious crisis. It's a place where you see contemporary persecution. It's a place where you see people being killed for their faith and people are not relenting. They're ready to die more instead of giving up. And uh, when you come to the southwest of Nigeria, there's, so, there's also a mighty significant phenomenon happening there. That's where you have a church that currently sits a million people at a service and they are currently building 10 million auditor uh, a 10 million seat auditorium for a single service. So Nigerian Christians are not giving up. And I think the reason is because Nigeria is a strategic end time player in God's uh, plan. That is why the devil is invading massively. But I thank Dr. Uh, Gerard McDonald for what he has done. And I'll just give it up to him to just continue the work. Um, um, I guess I didn't do much. I just went and watched. And uh, well, I, I've been so impressed by um, the church in Nigeria. Um, I wonder if we can turn the lights down so you can see the pictures better. Uh, and there's about 15 seats up here in the front. 15 down here. Yeah, so come on down, those of you in the back. We don't want anybody standing. There are plenty of uh, chairs down here that, that, that are not being taken. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, Nigeria is the largest country in Africa. Uh, 200 million people. Uh, the, the, the UN says that by 2050, it will be the third largest country in the world, surpassing the United States in population. Why? Birth rate. The American birth rate is 1.88 per, per childbearing woman. Uh, in Nigeria, it's 5.5. Um, Nigeria um, is becoming, this, or is, the center of gravity for global Christianity. You know, global Christianity is now, uh, has moved um, to, to uh, the global south, and it's growing in the, global, in the global south, especially Nigeria. It was so refreshing to be there for me, because here in the States where we hear about churches uh, closing and shrinking and the rise of the nuns, N-O-N-E-S, in Nigeria it's just the opposite. 
Uh, churches are growing. There's faith everywhere. Muslims are full of faith. Christians are full of faith. Now, Nigeria is still a majority Christian country. Um, uh, the population, as I said, is, is, is close to 200 million, 50% Christian, 40% Muslim, 10% animist. Uh, so I went there, and, and well, wait, one more thing. Uh, I went to Jos. Jos is the biggest city in what's called the Middle Belt. It's in the middle of Nigeria, um, and it's still majority Christian. It's a city of almost one million people. Uh, but it's, as, as Chrysler was saying, it is the epicenter of the attacks by Muslims on Christians. Now, there, there are plenty of other, of other uh, rat, um, radical Muslim attacks on Christians in northern Nigeria. Uh, um, Jos is not northern Nigeria. It's in the middle. Um, but... Uh, they, the attacks seem, seem to be um, centering more in Joss. Why? Because for decades, I was told, um, radical Muslims have had a plan to take over uh, all, all of Nigeria because of its importance in Africa, the largest country. And the Middle Belt is in, in as Chrysler said, the plateau state, the, um, the most pleasant part of Nigeria to live in. And it's got great farmland. Uh, it's a wonderful place, a wonderful climate. And so it, it is still majority Christian, but the radical Muslims want to take it over. And, and so they are hoping to drive the Christians out by intimidation, by fear, by terror. And uh, so this is what's going on. Now, I was invited by Archbishop Kwashi, who was our Reformation lecture, um, lecturer, here a few years ago, and I was invited by him to come and uh, teach at the seminary. Uh, so I spent a few days in downtown Joss teaching at the cathedral, uh, uh, teaching about 250 um, priests and their wives and, and deacons and their wives and catechists and their wives. And catechists are male, male and female. Uh, uh, you know, a catechist is a teacher of the faith. And and then I went out to the seminary here, out on the outskirts of Joss, uh, and taught at the Christian Institute. That's the Archdiocese of Joss's uh, seminary. Now, 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 these are Anglicans, so this is the Anglican Seminary. Um, and this is a wonderful man. He is the principal of the Institute, the dean of the seminary. Uh, his name is Godwin Maccabee. Just a very godly man and a wonderful wife. He's got a couple little kids. Um, these, these are the students I taught at the seminary. So you see there, these mo uh, the, the men in black are training to be priests. Uh, some are training to be deacons. The men and women in white are public health workers. And, and you know, Nigeria has this wonderful um, practice of, or, or, or at least the Anglicans do, of saying to these public health workers, we want you to be trained at the seminary so you learn how to be a Christian public health worker. So not only getting all the medical training, they also get theological training here um, at the seminary. And I just had a wonderful time with these, these, the, these students. Half my time was spent in answering questions. And I'm kicking myself for throwing away all the little scraps of paper on which they wrote their questions. I should have brought them home. They're absolutely fascinating because, you know, they don't have all, they, they have lots of the same questions we have here, but they have other questions too that are just fascinating. Um, now, just to show you what it's like out here on the outskirts of Joss, this is the road into the seminary. Those buildings on the left, top, are seminary buildings, uh, not you know, just a few of them. Uh, this is the road. Now, in case you can't tell, that's solid rock, and that's a river. So you have to cross over the river in your car, and right up here, uh, I don't have a pointer, this is rock that goes up at about a 30-degree angle, and you have to drive here, and your car is, is like this. This is the road into the seminary.
This is a um, road that um, in Joss that is a dangerous road. It goes through the Muslim area. And Hassan John, whom I'll show you in just a minute, uh, took me on a drive showing me all the inter quote unquote in interesting places. The, the, uh, um, now this is a main road in Joss. So in order to get from, from one place in Joss to another place, uh, this is the best road to take. And in, in the past, including the recent past, um, uh, if you were a Christian, and Hassan John told me that the, the uh, Nigerian Muslims in Jos can tell who a Christian is just by looking at their faces. I couldn't tell, but that's what Hassan told me, and, and Chrysan is nodding his head. And so re recently and several times in the past, during, when, when things are tense, they would stop a Christian car and pull them out and beat them up or kill them. So it's a dangerous area. Um, now, now, just to give you a few figures, um, this, uh, these Muslim attacks on Christians uh, have been going on since 2001. And now, now, there were others before then, but the recent spate. And just since January 1 of this year, 8,000 Christians have been murdered by radical Muslims. Uh, and the most radical group is called Boko Haram. Uh, since 2009, 20,000 Christians have been massacred. Two million Christians have been displaced from their homes. So, th this is pretty big. Um, now, these are two of the bravest men I've ever known. Pro probably the two bravest men I've ever met in my life. Uh, on the left is Father Mark Mukan, and he is, he's got a wife and kids, and he plants churches, and he's got a church plant right now, an underground church plant uh, in the village that's the headquarters of Boko Haram, and he planted it there purposely. I mean, I mean he, he, he risks his life on a regular basis. Uh, on the right is Hassan John, uh, and Hassan is, uh, was a radio show host. Uh, he, was, he was trained as a journalist at the university, and he was a radio show, uh, show host in 2010, and he would report, you know, starting in, in 2009 when, when the attacks picked up, he would report on the attacks uh, from his radio show, and eventually people started calling him. Uh, because they knew he was willing to report these things, and not all reporters were willing to report them. And so they would call him to come to the scene. So he would usually be the first reporter to the scene of a massacre. He's, he has come to over 100 massacres. And one, he said, he came upon it after it was done, and he, 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 uh, he came upon 500 mutilated bodies. Um, he has become the principal source to the outside world of this Nigerian jihad, this Muslim war on Christianity in Nigeria. Uh, some of you know the name Baroness Caroline Cox in England. Uh, she frequently reports to Parliament. Uh, she is a Christian spokesperson for persecuted Christians around the world, and she has particular interest in Nigeria because Nigeria is a former British colony, and, and the British Parliament has a particular interest in what's going on in Nigeria, but they haven't done enough yet. Caroline Cox uh, convened, uh, helped convene two sessions of Parliament this past summer to, to try to uh, talk about what's going on in Nigeria, the, these massacres. Hassan John is her principal source her principal contact. Uh, he's also been a contact for CNN News. Um, he, so many pastors have come to Hassan, uh, Anglican priest, and said, said, Pastor Hassan, what do I tell my people? We're being killed. 
and we pray and we fast and we still are being killed. What do I tell them? They say, doesn't God love us? You know, you know, why isn't God answering our prayers? We, the attacks haven't stopped. And so Hassan John has organized apologetics seminar, uh, seminars around northeastern uh, Nigeria and the middle belt of Nigeria. And he, um, he has to announce the seminars only one hour ahead of time by cell phone because of the great danger of being attacked in the seminars. And he only invites those who have been invited by another Christian pastor who knows very well this new Christian pastor and can attest to him because of the danger of plants and informers who, who then will send a suicide bomber. They've, they had to cancel two of these seminars because they heard a suicide bomber was on the way. One time it was a little girl, 10 years old, who had a bomb planted on her under her hijab. Um, so, what do they, what, what, so what does Father Hassan teach these pastors? And these aren't just Anglican pastors. They're, they're uh, Church of the Redeemer pastors, the biggest denomination in Nigeria. They're Pentecostal pastors. They're Baptist pastors. Uh, and Anglican pastors. And he says, basically, he teaches them five themes. And each one he develops at length. First, God, well, there is evil. And you know, so the basic question is, why, why does a loving God permit these massacres? Why isn't he stopping them? So number one is, God, God gives us free will. He loves us enough to give us free will. Free will to refuse him as well as to accept him. And number two, um, this life is not all there is. There's life after death, after which there will be judgment. We are living for the next life. But number three, God is just, and all evil will be punished by a just God. Number four, God, God is also love. And we see this especially on the cross. And it's there that God himself was murdered by evil men. So God understands evil attacks by, by, by evil men. But it was through the cross that love was released to the whole world. And then number five is filled with testimonies. He brings people to testify of how they found God in the midst of terror. And at the end of these seminars, uh, these pastors say, thank you, thank you. Now we have something to tell our people. And uh, he was telling me the one testimony. Well, well, many of these pastors say the same thing. I will go on preaching the gospel. And, I, and if I'm killed, so be it. That's, that's their attitude. Now, this is a... Um, burned out truck that I came upon and just took a picture of it. Um, we don't know if the driver survived, but, but this was an attack probably by the Fulani tribesmen. Um, the world is uh, telling, is being told the story largely by the uh, Muslim government, and the government is under the control of Muslims, and so are the security forces, and so is the army, and that's the problem. Uh, even though Christians are the majority, the government is very much controlled by Muslims. And the President Buhari is telling the world, really, it's, uh, this is just a, a clash, and that's the word that's used. Um, English is the national language. A clash between Fulani tribesmen uh, who are herders and migrate. Uh, it's between them on the one hand, and, and involves their cattle, and farmers on the other hand, and most of these farmers are Christian. So it's uh, you know, it's just a clash between two different lifestyles. And, you know, Hassan, Father Hassan, who's probably the best expert on all of this, says, no, that's not true. For, for, for decades and decades, the, the Christian farmers got along just fine with, with the Muslim, mostly Muslim Fulani uh, herders who would bring their cattle through, you know, each year and very peaceably, and they worked out uh, well. But, but starting in 2001, 
Boko Haram uh, started to deputize and militarize the Fulani um, and radicalize the Fulani and arm them with machine guns and uh, machetes. And so uh, that's what's been happening since 2001, particularly since 2009, and then January 1st of this year. Uh, the attacks always come in the middle of the night. Um, and so Christians, uh, I was teaching at the seminary, and one of the leaders of the seminary, who's only, you know, he's a young man with a wife and a baby on the way. He looks about 30. And I said, Daniel, how, how did your family do last night? And he said, we couldn't sleep. And I said, why? He said, well, all of the Muslims in our neighborhood moved out yesterday. And we don't know why, but we've heard that um, uh, their, the Muslim leaders had told them to move out because, because we're planning an attack on this neighborhood and we don't want you to be caught in the crossfire. Now, I, I'm, I, I'm going to show, and I think there's a blank here now, David. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm going to show some images here of mutilated bodies. Uh, you might want to close your eyes. If this is going to be hard for you, I don't want to give you nightmares. But just as um, the abolitionists in the 19th century before the Civil War insisted on talking about the evils of slavery, and just as pro-lifers insisted on showing pictures of aborted babies because otherwise we don't know the reality. Um, I think it's important for, for, for those of us who, who, who can stomach it, and, and some of us can't, so, so don't worry about that if you can't. Uh, 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 I think it's important to, to see it um, if, if you think you can. So, so close your eyes. Uh, I'll go through these very quickly. Okay, now, uh, now, now, now let me show a few more pictures, uh, not violent, not graphic, don't worry. And then we're going to show a short video made by a pastor just a week ago at, a, after uh, an attack. Uh, oh, oh, it's right here, okay. So um, what's today? Today is Thursday. Not this past weekend, but the previous weekend, there was another attack in Joss, uh, 14 Christians were killed, uh, others wounded. A pastor and his wife and their two children, Christ's son, is that right, were burned alive in their house. And one of the young women killed was a parishioner of this pastor. And he's going to talk. And, it, you know, he's, uh, he talks very quickly. You might not be able to understand what, what he's saying. That's why um, David has put right in front of you a transcript of what he's saying. So take a look at the transcript, and we're going to roll the, um, the video now. Do I just click on this, David, and, and the video should? Same thing. All right. Hmm. Then the soldiers came in. 
trying to cause confusion. Yes. And who yes. are yes. these army men that are using machine motorcycle? Yes. 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 We stand for us. That's we it. have nobody. Everybody, we are now ready to do the last prayer. Since Islamic agenda is taking over the nations, now live at the police station in Barkiladi. Look at those at the IDPs. We have nobody to stand. And we are the survivor. Now more IDPs are being added. Where did they want to go? They have already signed our land, has been relocated to them. They have signed our villages, have been relocated to school and their husband. And nobody is talking. Even my colleagues' reverends are keeping quiet. Women are dying every day. Men are dying. What do you want us to do? Please, please, I'm begging you, Congressman of London, please stand for the helpless. We have nobody. Brute, I know you are a friend of mine in Facebook. So he's crying out for us in Britain and in the United States to contact our governments uh, because um, one, that's a good strategy. If our government puts pressure on the Nigerian government, the Nigerian government um, might feel ashamed and might be pressured just because of world opinion, and world opinion is very powerful, uh, to do something. Because the Christians I talk to, uh, Christian leaders, uh, like Archbishop Kwashi, who knows a lot of these Muslim leaders of the government, uh, he says the only thing that will speak to them is international pressure. And uh, because the government is controlled by Muslims, there is some thought, well, Buhari himself, the president, uh, many Christians think that he is Boko Haram himself. Uh, he's a member of it. And so what happens over and over and over again is the government promises, yeah, we'll see what we can do. And then an attack comes and, and the police don't go in to stop it. They look the other way. Uh, the army looks the other way. Now, now, there are Christian policemen. They're Christian in the army. There are Christians in army leadership who are heartbroken about this, but they don't have the political power. So, so this is why um, it would be good if you and I would write our congressman and, and ask them to uh, ask our State Department, ask our president to, 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 to put public or private pressure on the Nigerian government. Now, before I left uh, um, Joss, I had the great privilege of meeting with two Muslim leaders in Joss. And uh, the man on the left is the present um, uh, uh, Muslim leader of a large community of Muslims in Joss. And the man on his right is his co-leader. He, uh, you know, is pretty fuzzy. I know you can't see much, but he's much older. Um, and he is, he is uh, kind of retired from leadership, but he still advises uh, the man on the left, who is the current leader. And so um, uh, they spoke in their tribal language, not in English, but the man on the left, the current leader, his son was there, who is uh, very well educated. Uh, he's getting a, deg a degree in English at the university very sophisticated, a wonderful young man, about 30, who's got wife and kids, and he was our translator. So, um, so I asked these two men, I said, um, what do you think of these Muslim attacks on Christians? Do you think they're justified? And he said, no, we don't agree, well, both of them said, we, um, we don't agree with what's going on, they are not following the teachings of Islam, and the Christians who retaliate, they're not following the teachings of Christianity either, uh, of Jesus, he said. Um, um, 
He said, the reason why this is happening, yeah, so I said, why do you think this is happening? And, and they said, we, 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 we think it's happening because uh, the Fulani had some of their cattle stolen. And the Fulani, you know, the tribesmen, uh, don't forgive very easily. So they're getting back at the Christians for having their cattle stolen. Now, Archbishop Kwashi personally told me, he said, that's a complete myth. No cattle have been stolen, but that is what is... Uh, what, what, what is given out to the international media, well, and even the Nigerian media. And, and, and he said there's no substance to it whatsoever. Um, but so these two men told me, uh, they said, don't judge all the Fulani by these renegades. Uh, you know, some of the Fulani are really good people. Um, and I said, um, now, I heard a report from a former missionary to Nigeria who is now living in Jerusalem telling me through email when I was there in Joss that Archbishop Kwashi is a troublemaker. And they sort of had it coming. And I said, what do you think about that? So, so I asked these, these two Muslim leaders because I know they know Archbishop Kwashi very well. And they said... Whoever said that doesn't know what he's talking about. He said, the Catholics were here first, but it was the Anglicans who started talking with us. And Archbishop Kwashi led the effort, and he's become a very good friend. Um, we have been friends for a long time. That's a direct quote. So um, then I went outside that, that little uh, house, and this was their niece or, 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 or a granddaughter. She's about 17 years old. And, and Father Hassan uh, is very good friends with these guys. He, he's got many, many Muslim friends. Archbishop Kwashi has many, many Muslim friends. And so um, she knows uh, Father Hassan. And they were talking in the tribal language. And... Um, He's helped her out before. And so she said to him, uh, you know, can you help me, you know, Father Hassan, can you get me, help me get money for the university application? I really want to go to the university. And Father ha Hassan said, I'll, I will work on it. In Nigeria, or, or at least in Jos, at the University of Jos, it costs $70 just to get the application to, to apply to the university. And, you know, um, $30, $35 is about a month's salary. Uh, uh, so it's like two months' salary just to get the application to go to the university. And basically what she's asking Father Hassan is for a financial help because she can't afford that. And, and he said he would work on it, and I'm sure he will. I mean, he's given tremendous help to so many Muslims because he's trying to reach out to Muslims. And... And actually, Archbishop Kwashi and Father Hassan have wonderful relations with Muslims in Jos. Um, so um, I, I was really tired at the end of my uh, time there, and I had one last Sunday. Well, well actually, my interviews were on the Monday after Sunday, but... But I was really looking for, uh, you know, they were going to have a party in my honor um, on, on a Saturday before the Sunday at the Archbishop's house. And I got there, and, and everyone was in crisis mode because the previous night, uh, Boko Haram had broken into Archbishop Kwashi's, uh, uh, you know, I say compound because it's uh, several buildings because he's the Archbishop and he's got people who are living there. and and he's got about 50 children whom he, he and his wife uh, have adopted. Yeah, 50, five zero. Um, and the previous night, they'd come in and stolen all of his cattle. And his neighbor, who loves the archbishop, he's not an Anglican, I don't think, got up in the middle of the night, heard all the noise, and went out there trying to protect the archbishop, and he was shot dead. And so... Um, everyone had come for this party and it turned instead into a time of prayer and what shall we do 
And the Archbishop was just absolutely resolute. I mean, we will keep preaching the gospel. If we die, we die. And so the next morning, I mean, I was just worn out emotionally. And I was really looking forward to going to a great Nigerian worship service and sitting in a pew and just taking it all in. And the Archbishop's son, who is right behind me, uh, Rinji, who is supposed to come here to get a D-min, and, and, and hopefully you all will get to meet him in a, about a year or so, um, uh, drove me into the driveway of the church, one of Rinji's three churches that he pastors, and I said, Rinji, what are you going to preach on? He said, oh, haven't you heard? I said, heard what? He said, you're the preacher. <laughs> so, so, so anyway, so I preached, I preached for 45 minutes. <laughs> um, and I think that is the last slide. If you want to get the lights, are we going to have time for Q&A? And, and Christ's son is still here. I, I thought he was going to go, but, but maybe he can answer some questions too if he has time. Um, Hassan John? Oh, actually, um, I am sure, I mean, Hassan John is a priest in the Archdiocese of Joss, and I'm sure, I mean, they always have massive financial needs, so, so if you want to help them financially, they would greatly, greatly, greatly appreciate it, and I think, uh, you know, um, you talk to uh, me or somebody here at Beeson, and uh, we could, you know, tell you how to get the money over there. Um, but um, Gene, scholar, oh, uh, I, 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 I tell you what, Archbishop Kwashi would would really like is he wants to cement a relationship with Beeson. And we want to get some uh, young men over there to study for the ministry here. So, you know, if you want to start a, an Anglican Nigerian Beeson Scholarship Fund, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. And I, I'm sure Dr. Taylor uh, would, uh, would probably not be opposed to that, uh, our associate dean. Um, Oh, one thing about Hassan John, and, and, and keep your eyes peeled. Uh, I, I, if you read the Wall Street Journal, uh, the Wall Street Journal is going to publish an article by him on this Nigerian crisis um, in their weekly column called Houses of Worship. Now, it, it usually on Saturday, but I saw the last couple of weeks it, it ran on Friday. So either Friday or Saturday, look for Houses of Worship. It's not going to be this weekend but it's going to be shortly, in the next couple or three weeks, uh, it will appear. Hassan John wrote um, a wonderful summary, I think, of what's going on. So it's going to be in the Wall Street Journal soon. Does he have a regular news outlet that we can check more frequently? Uh, no. Uh, the, the question was if uh, you know, you know, you know, Hassan John has a regular news outlet. I don't think so. Uh, I don't think so. No, they're all in crisis mode, and he's, um, you know, they just lurch from crisis to crisis while preaching the gospel and planting churches. And they haven't let up on, on planting churches. I mean, they're, they're, they are adamant about that. That uh, I went to the last Eucharist uh, on the Monday morning, the same Monday in which I interviewed the uh, Muslim leaders, and uh, Archbishop Kwashi was presiding and preaching at the Eucharist. And it was just beautiful. I felt that I was back in the second or third century, and I was with, with, with one of these great leaders of the Church of God. And uh, he preached about, you know, we, we are being persecuted just like the early church, and let us not relax one bit our zeal to get the gospel out. If we die, we die. And I tell you, that just blew me away. I was so moved, and I still am. Yeah. 
you know, Dr. Cooley could probably an, an, answer that, and maybe Chrysan. Uh, yeah, uh, the question was if mission work is being done amongst, amongst the Fulani. Dr. Cooley, you know infinitely more about Nigeria than I do. Yeah, yeah. And uh, they have pretty widespread all across the country because Fulani is not limited to being in South Dakota State. There is a band of Fulani right across right. Nigeria and, and, and the whole Sahel that is under South of Sahara Desert. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, yes, they, they have. Mm -hmm. But let me, I would like to say at this point. Please. Pardon? I said it's good news, bad news. Uh, it seems that. Yeah, good. It, it, it seems that persecution and this life and death sort of living has been going on for quite some time. It's not just a very recent sort of thing. To the point that for many people in Nigeria, it is just the way it is. Mm -hmm. That is, it has become second nature. This is, we don't look upon it, they say, as anything unusual. This is daily life. Mm -hmm. So on the one hand, we have to commend them that they're able to uh, appropriate God's grace in that way and, mm -hmm. and look at it in that way because if they didn't they would all go crazy from mm -hmm. worry and uh, fear mm -hmm. and whatever mm -hmm. so uh, that's and that in itself then is an element of spread of the gospel mm. because if they can put aside mm. worry about the things that you mm -hmm. and I would worry about on a constant basis mm -hmm. then they've got more time and more energy to put into their witness Mm -hmm. uh, now, Jerry, did you have a question? On your blog, you summarized things that you learned from the Nigerian Christians. Mm -hmm. I was wondering if you wanted to share with us how they showed you more of Christ and more of Christian life. Well, I mean, uh, as I said, uh, there, and as Dr. Cooley said, daily courage, daily determination to follow Christ no matter what. and. And they know, as Dr. Cooley was just saying, that following Christ for us might mean death um, in ways that we can only begin to imagine because we don't really face that in this country. So that, 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 that was a tremendous uh, inspiration to me. Uh, also, you know, and this is probably more Nigerian culture, but I think it comes out of the Christian, you know, you know the history of, uh, well, well, I don't know. It, 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 uh, an extraordinary friendliness and sense of dignity that, that, that really impressed me. Now, hey, people in Birmingham are friendly. They're, they're really friendly and, and even friendlier than, than in Southwest Virginia where I came from, where Gene and I came, came from. But, 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 but there's such a sense of graciousness in at least the society I got to know in, in in, in, in Joss. I mean, all the Nigerians I met, and towards one another, when, when, when they meet someone, they, they have this little bow kind of in respect. And, uh, and, and the other thing, and this is very sort of mundane, you might say, but I mean, these, these, these almost all the Nigerians I met, they, you know, except for some of the wealthy ones in, in Abuja, the capital, they, they, they live on one, and one or one and a half meals a day. And I mean, most of these young people I met were, were university educated. And they're making $35 a, uh, a month, working often 12 hours a day. And so I asked, I remember Joseph, this uh, young, young man at the hotel I was staying at, um, you know, he just got off the graveyard shift at 7 a.m. And I said, Joseph, uh, did you eat anything last night since, since your dinner? 
at six. He said, no, no. And I said, are you going to eat anything now? Well, you're going to go home now and sleep part of the day? He said, yeah, yeah. And, and are you going to eat anything during the day? And he said, no, why? And uh, I said, don't you get hungry? And he lit up in this huge smile and he said, oh, we get used to it. <laughs> and, you know, the other thing is, even though they only make $35 a month, uh, and often university educated, their clothes are always immaculate. And the way they dress for church on Sunday morning, beautiful. Um, that really impressed me. So, Dr. Cooley. Okay, we'll try again. We often said, and, and it's true in Nigeria, but in lots of places in the world, you wonder how it is that people who have so little give so much. They have so little, they give so much. Mm -hmm. Now, the question was asked something about uh, Nigerians' response to the, to the gospel and how they were busy in their church planting and these sorts of things. This is something that amused us when we were there, and yet at the same time, it's sort of, you know, it's a kind of a, a sour amusement sometimes. Mm. You know, when in our calendar here, if Christmas Day is going to be on Thursday, uh, okay, big news, we get a holiday from work. If Christmas Day is going to be on a Sunday here, sometime the week before, members of the church will be asking, will we be having services on Sunday? It's Christmas Day. Well, Nigerians would absolutely ridicule you to death if they knew that was going on. Because A, number one, they're going to have worship. And there are many places where Nigerian laypersons, just with basic education, basic experience. They move into a community, they're newcomers, but if they're a Christian, I promise you they will have a service the first Sunday they're there in their home. Oh. They may not mm. know many people, but they're going to do it. Mm. And uh, so there. And I'd like to put in a word of appreciation because the Baptist and the Anglican traditions in Nigeria have a long heritage. Mm. It's illustrated during the days of the Civil War here in this country, our missionaries had to come back to the States. So the, the work that they had started was just left there. And so in effect, they asked their Anglican brothers, would you look after our work while we're away? Gladly, they said. Mm -hmm. Now, the irony of it is when they went back there, to check up how are things going, they had not lost one sheep. Oh. Hmm. I'd like to, um, we need to wrap up now. Dr. Chrysler Hunter, can you end this in prayer, please? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you because um, Jesus Christ is called the Lamb of the world. The Lamb of God had taken the sins of the world. Father, we thank you for what is happening in Nigeria. Father, we thank you because, Lord, your word says you will build your church and the gates of hate will not prevail against it. Father, we thank you that despite, Lord, the rising and the relentless attack on your church, your church is growing in bounds and in leaps in Nigeria. Father, we thank you for the work of the coolies. We thank you for the work of Dr. McDonald. Father, we thank you for the work of the Global uh, Voices and the Global Center here. Father, we thank you for everyone who has heard today. Father, we pray that, Lord, you send your angels and you send your fresh strength to the church in Nigeria. And, Lord, I just thank you because eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, neither has it come to the heart of men the things that you are still going to do in jails and in Nigeria. We thank you, Father because you will be glorified. Jesus, you are lifted up and you continually draw men unto yourself. 
Father, we receive strength. We receive courage. We receive inspiration from our brethren in Nigeria. And we thank you, Father, because your kingdom will come. Your will be done. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.